Angelo Ruggiero, a.k.a. Quack Quack, the nickname given to him for the simple reason he talked too much. So much so that it would cause big problems for not only himself, but other wise guys as well when information came to light in 1983 that Ruggiero was all over FBI wiretaps discussing family business and openly discussing his own heroin operations. Normally, the nickname Quack Quack wouldn't be synonymous with the mafioso who's supposed to operate under secrecy and live by omerta, which is a sworn oath to never speak to law enforcement. But the difference between Quack Quack and other gangsters is Ruggiero's childhood best friend was John Gotti, and his uncle was underboss of the Gambino family, Neil Della Croce. Gotti and Ruggiero came up together around East New York and Brooklyn, and by doing various street crimes, both men attracted the interest of the Gambino family, who would ultimately give them their first piece of work in order to prove their loyalty, and were tasked with killing a local Irish gangster named James McBratney, who was wanted for attempting to kidnap another Gambino family member. The two men tracked McBratney down to a bar in Staten Island, and when he refused to leave with them, they killed him on the spot. Gotti and Ruggiero fled, but eventually were caught and each pled guilty to manslaughter, where they would serve a short prison stint and were released on parole in 1977. Not long after their release, both men were inducted into the Gambino family, but despite now being made men, they were facing problems with then Gambino boss Paul Castellano, who was pressing them about selling drugs, which was a death penalty in the mob, and ordered them to stop. But by that point in the 1980s, the men were knee deep in the heroin business with no intentions on stopping. But it was only a matter of time that one of Ruggiero's men would be picked up for dealing dope and word came down that the FBI had recordings of Quack Quack blabbing away about his heroin business. And to make things worse, Ruggiero was also on those tapes bad mouthing Paul Castellano and other higher ups in the Gambinos which could be not only a death sentence for himself, but for Gotti and others as well for their participation in the narcotics business. Upon learning about the recordings through discovery, Castellano requested Ruggiero deliver him the tapes, but Gotti and Della Croce did their best to put it off as long as possible, knowing there would be retaliation if Castellano were to hear the things Ruggiero was speaking about. Also, as part of the fallout of Ruggiero being caught on wiretaps, it gave law enforcement probable cause to place bugs in other wise guys' homes and cars. One of those people being Castellano himself, who would also be caught on recordings and arrested, leaving him furious at Ruggiero. But despite Castellano's anger, Quack Quack's uncle, Neil Della Croce, was able to spare his nephew's life. But Ruggiero's safety would soon be compromised in 1985 when Della Croce passed from cancer, leaving Ruggiero exposed. It was around this time that people speculate the Castellano hit was planned. Some suspect the only way Gotti and his crew were to get around Castellano ordering their deaths was to hit him first. And that's exactly what happened on December 16, 1985 outside of Spark Steakhouse in Manhattan. With Castellano out of the picture, Gotti stepped up to Gambino boss and was voted in by other members of Cosa Nostra, making Gotti virtually untouchable. Gotti kept Ruggiero close by where he was placed in charge of ordering contract hits among other things, but trouble seemed to follow Ruggiero. So when Lucchese Capo Anthony Gaspipe Casso heard about Quack Quack being caught on wiretaps, he made a statement that Angelo was no better than a rat, which is a serious accusation because in that life, the penalty for ratting is death. Ruggiero was obviously angered by this comment and wanted revenge. According to Shadow of My Father, John Gotti Jr.'s book, he states that an, an attempt had been made to squash the beef by Lucchese Vicca Musso and Gambino John Gotti himself, and the hatchet was supposedly buried between the two men but Ruggiero had other plans in mind. With John Gotti being Quack Quack's best friend and now being boss and also being in jail at the time, Ruggiero put a hit on gas pipe using a local neighborhood guy non-affiliated with Cosa Nostra to attempt distancing himself in case things went wrong. 
but Angelo's efforts wouldn't pay off. In September of 86, while Gas Pipe was sitting in his car eating an ice cream cone, the local psycho, Jimmy Heidel, drove up on Castle's driver's side and let off a barrage of gunfire at Gas Pipe. Gas Pipe was hit, but still managed to get out and run into a nearby restaurant where he hid in a meat locker while he waited for police. Not only was the hit botched and Casso still alive, but Casso was able to get the ID of the shooter through his connections to the infamous New York mob cops, Louis Eppolito and Stephen Caracappa. Gaspipe knew of Heidel because in the neighborhood, he was known around as a crazy guy who would walk around with the tack dogs and always carry two pistols on him at all times. So he decided to use the crooked cops to stage an arrest on Heidel in an attempt to abduct him and interrogate him on who hired him to take Castle out. While Heidel was at a candy shop he owned, the detectives pulled up and cuffed him. Heidel, assuming he was under arrest, went willingly with the dirty cops, who then pulled into another parking lot and told him to get out of the car. Heidel, now realizing what was happening, tried to resist but he was pistol whipped into submission and thrown into the trunk of another car where he was then driven to a house in Mill Basin, Brooklyn on East 73rd Street and brought inside to an already tarped up room so the blood wouldn't stain the floors. And Castle began torturing him. In Gaspipe's own words, he shot Heidel 15 times not to kill him, but as a method of torture to get him to give up Rogerio. Heidel was shot burned with cigarettes and other things before he would cave and reluctantly gave Quack Quack's name. Gas Pipe immediately called Joe, Joe Butch Corral, and James Jimmy Brown Fallia from the Gambino family and bought them as witnesses to Jimmy Heidel, who he was keeping alive, and made Heidel repeat Rogerio's name and tell them Quack Quack was the man responsible for ordering the unsanctioned hit on Gas Pipe. It said Heidel kept insisting Gambino member Danny Marino was his uncle. So Gaspipe kept him alive while he sent Falia to get word to Marino about the situation. Marino denied any knowledge of the hit attempt and claimed he chased Heidel from the neighborhood years ago and had no care for whatever happened to the kid, even though it probably wouldn't have made a difference anyway. Gaspipe shot Heidel in the head and his body was disappeared. This move on Angelo Ruggiero's part in attempting an unsanctioned hit on Casso could have sparked a full-on war between the Lucchese family and the Gambino family, being that Gas Pipe was a made man. And in that life, whether you're made or not, you can never raise your hand to another made man, let alone attempt a hit without approval of the commission or the bosses of all the families. Especially with Casso being in another family, they could have took this as a threat to the Lucchese as a whole and took things into their own hands. Fortunately, Casso knew there was a feud between him and Ruggiero and knew he was acting as a rogue, lone soldier. So Casso went through the proper channels and called for a sit down where he requested that Ruggiero be handed over for execution. John Gotti, who is now released from jail after being acquitted in his 1985 federal case on behalf of Ruggiero, was met by Gaspipe and Gaspipe's representative, Vic Amuso. Despite Quack Quack attempting to hit without Gotti's knowledge, Gotti still had his back once again. He informed Castle and Amuso that Ruggiero was not going to be passed off to be executed despite the fact that what Ruggiero did was definitely punishable by death according to the rules of Cosa Nostra. Instead, Gotti countered by saying they couldn't kill Angelo, but instead he would be placed on the shelf indefinitely and would have no more dealings in Cosa Nostra business. Vic Amuso, who had a lot of respect for Gotti, and even though Casso didn't agree with the decision, Amuso agreed to Ruggiero being shelved and that settled things between the two families. Castle had no choice but to accept what was agreed upon, or at least he had to appear to accept it. But low-key, Gaspipe wanted revenge in one way or another. 
It's said that he tried to covertly start a war between the Gambinos and Lucchese by killing Patty Testa, who was Vic Amuso's good friend, and tried to make it look like the Gambinos did it, but his plan didn't work. As for Ruggiero, upon being placed on a shelf, John Gotti sent word that Quack Quack was declared persona non grata and can no longer be dealt with by other members of the family. Before we, he would have to serve time for all the things he was caught speaking on on them wiretaps, he became terminally ill, and on December 4th, 1989, Angelo Ruggiero passed away from cancer in Howard Beach, Queens. This was another episode brought to you by Wise Guy TV. If you enjoyed this video, please smash the like button. And if you want more videos like this, subscribe to Wise Guy TV and click the notification bell to make sure you receive notifications every time a new video is uploaded. I hope you were able to gain some insight as to why John Gotti had to shelf Angelo Ruggiero and gain insight into the feud between Ruggiero and Anthony Gaspipe Casso, which could have resulted in a huge gangland mob war in New York City. Fortunately for the men involved, and because of John Gotti's relationships, things were settled before it would go that far, and Ruggiero's life was spared from the violent hands of Anthony Gaspipe Casso. Thank you for watching. It's Wise Guy TV.